all of five, all of five, all of five beautiful penguins and penguinettes. How are you today? Isn't learning new things a wonderful thing? I started reading this book and I thought, wow, it has been so long since I've done a live reading and I know some of you really love that. So I decided to pop in here for 15 minutes or so and do a little bit of reading of this wonderful book about Chinese medicine by Ted J. Kapuchuk. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. He's an oriental medicine doctor. I think that's what OMD means. So much to learn, isn't there? I just want to say, let's just stop fighting each other. Isn't it time to stop peer pressuring each other to in any in any way? We need a clean slate for real. I just put up that clean slate video because I just cleaned like 11 pieces of slate today for three hours for a project. And I thought it was so funny, the metaphor that of having a clean slate. And I thought, isn't it time? Isn't it time? It's been over a year that we've been struggling with not only sickness, but also emotional chaos in this country. People siding up, people on sides like color war and literally race wars. And let's, can we even just for one night have a clean slate and just kind of pretend that we're in another dimension together where we just get to work on some fun things together? like learning new skills and pursuing our passions and just doing our hobbies and just feeling peaceful with that and not threatened in any way. Let's focus on that. Let's focus on learning new things together. What can we learn together so we're not against each other? So this beautiful book, where am I going to start? Page 116, 115, Chapter 5. We've been having a lot of stormy weather in Georgia, and the name of this chapter is Origins of Disharmony, Stormy Weather. Now I'm wondering, should I put a little music on, a little bit of flying penguin lullabies? Shall we do that? We all want clean water. We all want clean brains. And I think when we learn new things, it helps to clean our brains, which is different than brainwashing, even though that does sound cleansing. That's something else. Maybe we need to explore that word a little bit more. Chapter 5. The Web That Has No Weaver, Understanding Chinese Medicine, Ted J. Kapuchuk, Oriental Medicine. It's, and someone, the Science Digest said that this book demystifies Oriental medicine in a remarkably rational analysis of both its strengths and its weaknesses. There are strengths and weaknesses to everything, including us. We all have our kryptonite. And in some versions of that story, the kryptonite was what gave you power, not what took it away. Kind of like homeopathy. 
certain kinds of homeopathy, which gives you a little bit of a sickness to strengthen you. But can we be less invasive? Can we explore vibrational medicine? That's another story. You know I'm available for vibrational medicine. Origins of disharmony, stormy weather. In my early student days in China, I worried that the Chinese perception of disease, the ideas, as well as the vocabulary, was not only unusual and mysterious, but also just plain silly. It seemed too simple to talk, as the Chinese do, of dampness, wind, or heat as ger generative factors in illness. So just to back it up a little bit, in Chinese medicine, they say, oh, you have dampness in your body, you have heat in your body, you have wind in your body. That's like gas and other things. Um, so that was silly to him. Then one night while I was having dinner with the Chinese family I lived with, a woman at the table excused herself because of a headwind. That incident made me realize how culturally relative my medical perceptions were. To my Chinese friends, the idea of headwind was not at all outlandish. It was as grounded in reality as the Western concept of the flu. Chinese ideas simply represent a different way of organizing information about health and disease. I love that. I love organizing. And so I love that they put it like that. It's organizing information, a different way of organizing information for our health and well-being. Chinese medicine and Chinese philosophy, as we have seen, do not concern themselves very much with cause and effect or with trying to discover this cause that begets in linear progression, that effect. Their concern is with relationships. Their concern is with relationships, with the pattern of events, with the pattern of events. Thus, their idea of the way illness begins is very different from the Western view. In fact, the Chinese do not have a highly developed theory for the origins of disease. They conceive of certain factors that affect the body, factors that could be described in the Western vocabulary as causes. It is therefore tempting to the Western mind to describe them as such. But to the Chinese, these generative factors are not exactly causes. I'll say it again. They conceive of certain factors that affect the body, factors that could be described in the Western vocabulary as causes. It is therefore tempting to the Western mind to describe them as such. But to the Chinese, these generative factors are not exactly causes. Think about a garden. You can say the sunshine caused the garden, but it also needed the seeds, right? Take dampness, for example. In China, as in the West, people might say that someone became ill because he or she went out in the rain or got his feet muddy or because he lives in a damp basement. But, to the Chinese, dampness precipitates only a pattern of dampness. There is no distinction between the illness itself and the factor that caused it. There is no distinction between the illness itself and the factor that caused it. The question of cause becomes incidental. In this sense, the word cause is almost a synonym, a synonym for effect. In Chinese pattern thinking, further explained in chapter 7, 
What might at first seem to be a cause becomes part of the pattern, indistinguishable and inseparable from the effect. Pattern thinking subsumes the cause, defining it in terms of the effect and making it part of the total pattern. What we in the West call a cause has little importance in Chinese thought. The lines of causality are bent into circles. Nevertheless, the general population in China and its medical practitioners, when asked, why is there disharmony, speak of three categories of precipitating factors in illness. These are environment, emotional outlook, and way of life. Now, let me remind you, this isn't everyone in China. This is just people who practice Chinese medicine. The general population, including doctors, will sometimes think of these factors as causes. People assume that dampness, for instance, can cause illness in some people at certain times. Friends, relatives, and neighbors will advise a person to wear a raincoat or to move out of a damp basement. Teachers, parents, and philosophers jointly with physicians will recommend certain lifestyles or disapprove unhealthful activities. They will suggest a change in emotional attitudes or an environment if a person seems to be unwell or wants to maintain health. The giving of such advice is considered the province, not exclusively of the physician, but also of educators, leaders, and friends. Behavior prescribed by society is, however, presumed to be healthy and positive, and may also complement the work of the physician. How beautiful is that? really being our sister and brother's keepers, really taking on the role of educator, leader, and friend, and reminding people to be healthy and positive and make healthy and positive choices so that we make the physician's job easier. In the narrower, more precise and refined realm of medicine, pattern thinking about illness is more pronounced than it is in the general society. To the physician, the view of dampness, for example, as a cause of disease is less important than two other ways of thinking about it. The physician would first take note of the damp basement as a simple fact, a piece of information, a sign to be considered along with other signs. He may tell the patient to move. He may treat the dampness as a cause, but his main concern would be to place this sign into the patient's total configuration of signs, including color of face, pulse, tongue, emotional outlook, and so forth. The physician would see dampness as one element of a pattern of disharmony and would not necessarily single it out as a cause needing treatment. Treatment. So we all have very different emotional outlooks on what is going on right now. Are they all healthy outlooks? I don't know. That's a good question. I think that's something to look at because your outlook, your emotional outlook of things affects your inlook. It affects your health. The physician would see dampness as one element okay, of a pattern of disharmony and would not necessarily single it out as a cause needing treatment. The dampness is just part of the picture. Other people living in the basement may not get as sick. So something else is going on to make the patient sensitive. The physician's gaze inevitably goes to the complete arrangement of signs. If the patient can't move out of the basement, the doctor would try to reharmonize him or her so as to eliminate the sensitivity to dampness. 
And even if the patient could change homes, he or she would still need reharmonizing to deal with the pattern carried within that is susceptible to dampness. The amount of attention given to such relationships leads to the second and more important way a Chinese physician understands dampness as both an individual and, an, and a universal pattern. Dampness is a pattern of qualities and events that relates a person to the natural environment. The person is a microcosm manifesting the same configuration of signs as does the macrocosm. Hold that thought, I need some water. I still haven't finished this water. Dampness in the environment is wet, heavy, sodden, and lingering. Dampness in the body makes a personal, makes a person heavy, bloated, and slow. If one's internal pattern is very swampy, one can manifest such bodily signs without ever having been exposed to a drop of external moisture. It is important to note that the dampness outside the body may precipitate a condition of dampness within the body. But exposure in a causal sense is unnecessary. One is more likely to have a damp illness in London but it's still possible in Arizona. Dampness is recognized by what is going on inside, not by knowledge of external exposure. The condition is not caused by dampness. The condition is dampness. The cause is the effect. The line is a circle. The physician sees the bodily pattern as a miniature form of the more general natural image. And because the pattern of the body and of nature are similar, they share an identity of poetic equivalence. In answer to the question, why do people get sick? The Chinese can answer that precipitating factors in one of the three categories, environment, emotion, and way of life generate illness. But although one or another of these factors may be present at the beginning of an illness, that factor is never seen as separate from the illness. It is part of the web, one of the signs and symptoms the Chinese physician weaves into a diagnosis. This section is the six pernicious influences. I'll write that down in the chat box. The six pernicious influences. It's funny how influences sounds like influenza. The six pernicious influences are the environmental factors that play a part in disease. They include six climatic phenomena, wind, cold, fire or heat, dampness, dryness, and summer heat, and are also called the six eagles, or liu ji. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, probably not. The healthy body is a balance of yin and yang. It is sustained by a network of activity of complementary forces that generate and limit one another. Thus, the chi moves the blood, but also holds it in place. The heart star stores shen, spirit, and also moves blood. The spleen rules ascending. 
The stomach rules descending. The liver rules spreading. And the kidneys rule storage. The lungs rule the circulating and descending of chi. The kidneys govern the grasping of chi. When the balance is upset, yin and yang lose adjustment. The body may then be susceptible to the harmful effects of a pernicious influence. A pernicious influence, of course, is just a natural event. It becomes harmful only when the body has an inappropriate relationship to it. When the body is weakened by an imbalance of yin and yang, a climatic phenomenon can invade the body and become a pernicious influence. The body in this state undergoes a conflict between the pernicious influence and the normal chi. The first encounter of the invading influence is with the body's protective chi. If the protective chi is strong, the influence is expelled and the individual recovers. Come to class every Monday and Wednesday to work on your protective chi with me live right here, 1.30 if I'm on time. But if the chi is weak or their pernicious influence is very strong, the illness develops and goes deeper, becoming more involved with the internal organs. Illness generated by any of the pernicious influences that have invaded the body usually comes on suddenly with no warning. They are characterized by aversion toward the particular influence. For example, fear of cold, dislike of wind, fever, chills, body aches, and general malaise. These symptoms are understood to be the result of normal chi and protective chi attempting to expel the influence. When a pernicious influence invades the body like this from the outside, it is called an external pernicious influence. A pernicious influence can also, however, arise internally. That sounds like it could be a song. External pernicious influence. External pernicious influence. In this case, the body manifests similar signs and symptoms. One important difference between the internal and external is that the illness does not usually come on suddenly, and often there are no fever or chills. A pernicious influence that develops inside the body is called an internal pernicious influence. An external pernicious influence usually accompanies sudden acute illness, whereas an internal pernicious influence is more often related to chronic illnesses. All the pernicious influences, however, are really models or images for bodily processes that mimic climatic conditions and are treated accordingly. You can have a tornado, you can have a hurricane in there. In the following description of each influencer, both the external and internal aspects are discussed. I said 15 minutes, it's already been 23. How much longer am I going to go? There are, am I going to read about wind, cold, heat, dryness? Ooh, the seven emotions. I kind of want to get to that. And the way of life. Let's keep going. I might need to get some hot tea so I don't get too damp in front of the computer. I totally match my background today. I am the forest and my fishies are the red. All right, wind. Wind in the body resembles wind in nature. It is both movement and that which generates movement in what would otherwise be still. It produces change and urgency in what would otherwise be slow and even. And it causes things to appear and disappear rapidly. Wind affects the body just as it moves the branches and leaves of a tree. Accordingly, wind is a yang phenomenon. Yang as in yin and yang, not yang as in young and old. 
Wind is associated with the spring, but a disharmony characterized by wind, a wind disharmony, can appear in any season. The association of a pernicious influence with a season is one of potentiality. The body may be more susceptible to wind influences in the spring. And although there is a connection between the environment and the body, the body's inner dynamic may be affected by wind in any other season and may not be affected by it in the spring. The correspondence between a pernicious influence and its season is poetic, but real. It means that the microcosm is taking part in the life of the macrocosm. Wind is the one pernicious influence that rarely appears by itself. It's usually accompanied by some other external pernicious influence, such as cold or dampness. The presence of wind allows and even promotes the invasion of the body by the other influences. Therefore, the Ni Jing says that the hundred diseases develop from wind because wind is light and airy. That's interesting. So it's like wind brings the other influences in. It ushers. Because wind, um, therefore the Nijing says the hundred. Because wind is light and airy, the Nijing also says that injury by wind first affects the upper parts. That's interesting. Upper parts, shoulders. So shoulder stuff is a wind thing. Wind is thought to show itself initially on the upper and outer portions of the body, especially the face, skin, sweat glands, and lungs. Sometimes people affected by wind will recall recent exposure to drafts. Because wind is associated with movement, it is often recognized by such signs as pain that moves from place to place. Itching or skin eruptions that change locations, spasms, tremors, of the limbs, twitching, dizziness or tetany. Summarizing this, the Nijing comments, wind is adept at movement and many changes. When wind is an external pernicious influence, it is called external wind. External wind is characterized by its suddenness of onset, as are all the external pernicious influences. It is often accompanied by fever, a sign of the conflict between an external influence and normal chi. Fear of drafts, sweating, sudden headaches, stuffed nasal passages, itchy or sore throat. Because it is usually accompanied by another pernicious influence, it contains the signs of the other pernicious influences. External wind often resembles what Western medicine describes as the onset of an infectious or contagious disease. Internal wind usually accompanies a chronic disharmony. I'll say that again. Pern because it is usually accompanied by another pernicious influence, it contains the signs of other pernicious influences. External wind often resembles what Western medicine describes as the onset of an infectious or contagious disease. So basically we are experiencing a very windy atmosphere right now. Internal wind usually accompanies a chronic disharmony frequently, though not exclusively, of the liver. The liver is responsible for smooth movement in the body and thus is especially susceptible to irregular movement, a condition that would be described as wind. Signs of internal wind may include dizziness, tinnitus, numbness of the limbs, tremors, convulsions, and apoplexy. Here's a clinical sketch. A patient has what Western medicine calls an upper respiratory infection. He is chilled and has a stuffed nose, a slight fever, and head and body aches. The Chinese diagnosis might be external wind and cold invading the body. Treatment would call for expulsion of wind using acupressure points such as gallbladder 20, 
the Chinese name for which is wind pond or feng qi, and certain herbs. Fresh ginger, for example, enters the lung meridian and causes sweating, which expels wind and cold. So where is gallbladder 20? Let's look it up. Because we can do acupressure on it. I'm not sure if I can find the gallbladder points in here. Maybe some of you know I can describe it in the comments. <sighs> Gallbladder twenty. I don't see you in here. I see one to ten. I see thirteen. I don't see twenty. I know. Gallbladder begins in the outer corner of the eye. Hmm. That's weird. Well, it shows the, the gallbladder meridian, but not point 20 for some reason. But that is definitely one of the lines that we do, one of the points we do in class at the end of class on the outside. So this is right here, like above the knee, like about, well, it's, it really runs runs the gamut, but there's definitely a point before you get to that midway point to the butt. And then right in the center of the hip, there's a point <laughs> right there. Because um, it's easier to do uh, the head it goes behind the ear here. Oh, that feels good. So yeah, it goes right behind the neck and right like right here. And then up, up over the head. And it looks like it goes um, to the tip of the toe, but then also to the big toe, crosses over. Anyway. So that's interesting that you want to work on the gallbladder meridian to expulse the wind. That could be in the uh, lungs. All right, enough about wind. Now we go too cold. Speaking of wind, I still have to finish blow drying my hair because it's getting cold from the AC. Cold. Aha. Uh -huh. Here's the Chinese word for it. Cold in the body, as in nature, is a yin phenomenon. It is associated with winter, the way wind is associated with spring. But again, cold does not appear only in its corresponding season. A cool breeze in the summer, for example, can generate a pattern of external cold, especially if a person is very sensitive because of pre-existing internal disharmony. Cold weather in general, however, aggravates a cold condition in the body. The most important sign of any cold influence is that the individual feels cold. The entire body, or part of it, may be cold to the touch or may have a pale, frigid appearance. The person often has a marked aversion to cold and seeks warmth, perhaps in the form of hot water bottle, a hot water bottle or an extra sweater. Hey, I moved to the south and I wanted some heat. Cold in the body also acts as it does in nature. It contracts things, obstructing normal movement. It freezes things, leading to slow movement, underactivity and hibernation. 
cold in the meridians can block the circulation of chi or blood, causing severe, sharp, cramping pain that is somewhat responsive to heat. Cold in the meridians of the limbs may lead to contractions and stiffness. As the Nijing remarks, cold enters the meridians and there is retardation of movement. The chi cannot penetrate. And finally, there is pain. So that's interesting. Pain is the absence of chi in this case. Secretions and excretions related to cold disharmonies are clear or white with a frozen look, such as clear music. Music. So just clear mucus, sputum, bottom, vomit, urine, or diarrhea with a clear or white fluid. The Nijing says, cold is watery, transparent, clear, and cool. External cold disharmonies, like all external pernicious influences, come upon the patient suddenly. They're usually accompanied by fear of cold, as well as chills, mild fever, headache, and body aches. Usually the chills are more pronounced than the fever, and the fever is interpreted as the body's effort to expel the external influence. So if you have an invasion of cold, the body heats itself up with a fever to get rid of the invasion of the coldness. Since cold obstructs the pores, there is usually little sweating associated with cold disharmonies. Ex internal cold is related to insufficient yang. Yang is heat and, and activity. So when it's insufficient, it follows that the body will be cold and slow. Internal cold is usually chronic and is associated with underactivity and general slowness or, or depression. I'm adding depression, I didn't say that here. The body or portions of it will be cold. The person will often need more sleep than usual and will crave warmth. Just as internal wind is often connected with the liver, internal cold is often related to the kidneys since the kidneys have the light gate fire and are the source, the source of the body's yang. Clinical sketch. A male patient complains of difficulty in urinating and of dribbling urine as opposed to a basketball. Problems that gradually become more frequent over several years. A Western physician diagnosis is a prostate condition, benign prostatic hypertrophy. The patient visits a Chinese physician who notices that his face is pale and he is wearing a lot of sweaters. The patient tells the physician that he has always disliked cold and that he sleeps curled up. These and other signs, such as a deep, slow pulse and a pale, moist tongue point to a pattern of internal cold. Treatment might include moxibustion, which is stimulation by burning mugwort at such points as governor vessel four, the Ming Men life door, and kidney two, uh, the Rangu blazing valley, in order to strengthen the kidney chi. The physician might also prescribe decoctions containing praying mantis cocoons. Weird. As they enter the kidney meridian and strengthen or tonify the light gate. Fire. <sighs> Speaking of fire, the next pernicious influence is heat or fire. Re or fuel. And I know I'm not pronouncing those right. The terms heat and fire can be used interchangeably. Although heat usually connotes an external pernicious influence and fire an internal pernicious influence. Fire, however, is also a normal characteristic of the body. It is the body's yang aspect as opposed to the yin. 
one of the two bodily principles that must be kept in balance. The fire that is the normal yang of the body should not be confused with the fire pernicious influence, which is a source of disharmony. Heat or fire, because of its characteristic of being hot and active, is a yang phenomenon. It is associated with summer, but is a common year but it's common year round, and its signs within the body resemble its manifestations in nature. When heat pernicious influence is present, the whole body or portions of it feel hot or appear hot. The person affected by it dislikes heat and has a preference for cold. He or she will display such signs as high fever or red face, red eyes, and dark reddish urine. Heat can also collect in small areas of the body's surface, creating fire poison. What in the West would be called inflammation? Fire poison. Wow, that's a cool name for inflammation. I'm feeling very fire poisoned today. Wow. Its symptoms are carbuncles. I've never heard that word, a carbuncle. What's a carbuncle? It's not an uncle that eats carbs. I can tell you that. Carbuncle. It's a cluster of pus-filled bumps. Ooh. All right. So it's kind of like boils. So where am I? Symptoms of fire poison are carbuncles, boils, reddish ulcers, other skin lesions that are red, swollen, raised, and painful skin. Secretions and excretions related to heat or fire, pernicious influence tend to be sticky and thick and to feel hot. Cough with thick yellow mucus or stools with mucus and blood accompanied by burning sensation in anus. Heat or fire pernicious influences can also dry out bodily matter and deplete the fluids. Thus, a dry tongue, unusual thirst, dry stools, or scanty urination are other possible signs of the presence of this influence. Heat pernicious influence, being a yang phenomenon, induces movement, as does wind. Wind is more mobile, however, and its movement is trembling or spasmodic, sudden or abrupt. Heat, on the other hand, is said to induce reckless movement, especially of blood and shed. Hold on one second. I have to blow dry my hair a little bit more. I'll be right back. Not very good. Okay, so where are we now? Heat, on the other hand, is said to influence. Oh wait, wind is more mobile, however, and its movements is trembling or spasmodic, sudden or abrupt. Heat, on the other hand, is said to induce reckless movement, especially of blood and shed. In the blood, such movement often leads to hemorrhaging and red skin eruptions. In the shen, reckless movement may be recognized by confused speech or delirium, for instance, in a patient with high fever. External heat or fire disharmonies are marked by high fever, headache, since heat rises, swollen and sore throat, dry mouth, great thirst, desire for cold, occasional bloody splutum, skin eruptions, irritability, or delirium. There is usually a high fever with heat, 
a higher fever with heat than with cold, and only slight or no chills, more headaches, and fewer body aches. This is because heat tends to rise and it obstructs the meridians less than cold does. As with the other external pernicious influences, the onset of illness is usually sudden. Internal heat or fire develops from disharmonies of the yin and yang of the various organs. It will be discussed in chapter seven. So if you want me to come back and read chapter seven of this book, the web that has no weaver sometime, let me know. I like doing these live readings. So here's the clinical sketch on a heat pernicious influence. A patient suddenly gets a high fever and a severe sore throat. She has a red face, a dry hacking cough, and no fear of cold. A Western physician takes a throat culture and discovers the presence of group A, beta hemolysia streptococcus. Antibiotic drugs are prescribed with good results. If the same patient had gone to a Chinese physician, he very likely would have diagnosed a heat pernicious influence. Herbs like coptis and scutellina, scutellina which disperse and cool fire, would have been prescribed. The results would have been adequate, though perhaps slower to achieve than with the antibiotic treatment. Modern research shows, incidentally, that both coptis and scutellina inhibit the growth of streptococcus bacteria. Acupuncture puncture treatment, such as needling large intestine number four, the hegu, adjoining valleys, to cool fire would in this case have offered some symptomatic relief and heightened the body's resistance, but would have been less effective than herbs. Hmm. And speaking of streptococcus, my friend told me at uh, the American Anatomy of honey with as much cayenne pepper as you can on it. Hold it in your mouth for five minutes if you can. Bye. Dampness, pernicious influence. Damp pernicious influences lead to clinical symptoms that resemble the properties of dampness in the natural environment. Because dampness is wet, heavy, and slow, it is yin. It is technically linked with what the Chinese call the long summer, but actually is associated with damp weather in any season. Living or working in damp surroundings or wearing damp clothing can also pave the way for dampness to invade the body. Dampness is heavy, turbid, and lingering. It tends to move things downward, and so the Neijing states that the lower body is the first area affected by dampness. As a yin phenomenon, dampness is like cold but its effects are distinguishable from those of cold. For example, cold pain is characterized by sharp, intense cramping, while damp pain is protracted and gives a feeling of heaviness. Is the music too loud? Damp pain is protracted and gives a feeling of heaviness. During a damp illness, the head may feel dull, as if in a sack, the Chinese say. The limbs may feel heavy and sore, and the patient will express a dislike for damp environments. Excretions and secretions associated with dampness are copious and often turbid, cloudy, or sticky like sand in the eyes. Sand in the eyes, cloudy urine, heavy diarrhea, heavy vaginal discharge, or fluid filled or oozing skin eruptions. External dampness can easily obstruct the movement of chi, producing fullness of the chest or abdomen and dribbling or incomplete urination or defecation. No basketballs. Or external dampness can penetrate the meridians, affecting the limbs and causing heaviness, stiffness, or soreness in the joints. It could also easily affect the spleen. The spleen rules the raising of the pure, transforming, pure essence into blood and chi by a vaporization process that requires a dry environment. A traditional Chinese saying sums this up as, the spleen likes dryness. The spleen is therefore especially sensitive to dampness. 
dampness can really distress the spleen and interfere with its raising of pure foods and fluids. This can be seen in signs like loss of appetite, indigestion, nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal edema or edema. At the same time, however, other spleen disharmonies, because they prevent the raising or transforming of fluids, can allow dampness to linger in the body, leading to a condition of internal dampness. External and internal dampness are distinguishable primarily by their speed of onset. External dampness will be acute and accompanied by other external signs, but will easily turn into internal dampness. And internal dampness will make a person more susceptible to external dampness. Either type of dampness lingers and stagnates and is likely to last a long time. All right, the clinical sketch of dampness. Oh, are y'all ready? Excuse me. Ben. Two patients have painful vesicular lesions on their body. What does vesicular mean? Vesicular. Vessels. Like your skin vessels. The first patient has the eruption on his face. The second patient has them on his lower trunk. A Western doctor diagnoses both conditions as herpes zoster and prescribes anal analgesics for the pain. And there is no Western style treatment for the virus causing the disease. The patients go to a Chinese doctor who will probably recognize two distinct patterns of disharmony. The patient whose eruptions are on the face might have a wind heat disharmony, while the patient with the eruptions on the lower trunk has a damp heat condition. Both are heat patterns, as the eruptions are red, painful, and swollen. The location of the eruptions is different because the precipitating factors, the pernicious influences, are different. Wind is light and leads to manifestations on the face. Dampness is heavy and so descends, resulting in eruptions on the lower trunk. For the first patient, the doctor would prescribe herbs and acupuncture that expel wind heat, while herbs and acupuncture that eliminate damp heat would be given to the second patient. These methods of treating herpes have been demonstrated effective, possibly because some of the herbs used inhibit the growth of the virus while the acupuncture would help relieve pain. Also, selecting an herbal treatment solely on the basis of Western knowledge of viruses would have been less effective than combining the herbs according to the traditional methods. Mucus is a form of internal dampness. Although it is not, strictly speaking, a precipitating factor in illness, it is related to dampness and is seen in conjunction with a great many disharmonies. The term mucus includes the Western meaning of a secretion of the mucous membranes visible, for instance, in the form of phlegm, but it also has other characteristics and connotations that make it an entirely different concept from that of Western physiology. Mucus generally arises with disharmonies of the spleen or kidneys that affect the movement of water in the body. Such condition allows dampness to linger, and the dampness may condense, creating mucus. Mucus is thick and heavy, heavier than dampness. It can more easily cause obstructions and can generate lumps, nodules, or tumors. That's interesting. I wonder if mucus is always considered the cause of tumors. When mucus collects in the lungs, there's coughing with heavy expectoration. Mucus in the heart can obstruct the shen, leading to muddled thought, stupor, coma-like states, chaotic behavior, or madness. 
Mucus in the meridians may result in numbness, paralysis, or the development of nodules and soft mobile tumors. Mucus in the throat can cause the sensation of a lump in the throat. An examination of the tongue and pulse will tell a physician whether or not mucus is present in a disharmony. A thick, greasy coating on the tongue or a slippery pulse are the two most important signs. Whenever there is mucus, it implies dampness. Remember, I told you about that white tongue. All right. The last pernicious influence, and then we get to talk about the seven emotions. Yay. Dryness. Dryness and summer heat are two distinct pernicious influences, but they are much less important than wind, cold, heat, and dampness. What? Everything's important. What are you talking about? This is because they are less frequently used as a description of the inner environment. In clinical practice, they are even more expendable than they are in the traditional theory. Goodness gracious. I think dryness has its feelings hurt. Saying that it's expendable. I need to drink some water speaking of dryness. You're not supposed to gulp water in Chinese medicine. You're supposed to like sip it slowly. Otherwise it can cause wind like burping. Dryness pernicious influence is associated with autumn and is a young phenomenon. It is closely related to heat. Dryness and heat are on a continuum with the dry and emphasizing dehydration and the heat and emphasizing redness. Oh, with the dry end emphasizing dehydration and the heat end emphasizing redness and hotness. Thus, dryness is accompanied by, excuse me, dry nostrils, dry lips and tongue, cracked skin and dry stools. External dryness often interferes with the circulating and descending functions of the lungs, manifesting perhaps a dry cough with a little phlegm, asthma or chest pain, as well as the signs of suddenness, fever, body aches, and other symptoms characteristic of the external pernicious influences. The few disharmonies that involve internal dryness will be discussed in chapter eight. Summer heat is purely an external pernicious influence that always results from exposure to extreme heat. Its symptoms include sudden high fever and heavy sweating. Summer heat easily injures the chi, causing exhaustion and depletes the fluids. It often occurs together with dampness. The six pernicious influences, external or internal, can never be seen in isolation from the body. They can only be recognized by the signs and symptoms that accompany them. And those signs and symptoms are part of a bodily pattern that is greater than any one pernicious influence. The dampness or the wind cold that, began a, that begins a disharmony is part of the disharmony itself. And the disharmony contributes to the condition of dampness or wind cold. The linear idea of cause and effect becomes a circle in Chinese medicine because Chinese pattern thinking subsumes all the pieces into a more important whole. Dampness or wind cold or other climatic phenomena are finally described of bodily states, or finally descriptions of bodily states, metaphors that relate what's going on in the body to its complement in the universe. As causes, they are secondary to the overall pattern. In fact, in some cases, exposure to dampness may generate a cold condition, or exposure to cold may generate a wind heat condition. And if someone has been exposed to dampness but manifests a heat pattern, then heat is what counts. Treatment will be for heat, not for dampness. In Western medicine, it is often impossible to treat a condition without knowing the cause. In Chinese medicine, the treatment is always for the condition itself, regardless of the cause. The pernicious influence as a cause is unimportant. 
An individual may have tendencies towards a certain state. One person is usually cold and damp, while another is hot and dry. Each of these people will receive a pernicious influence in his or her own way, so that it will become part of that person's unique pattern. The pernicious influence does not have any characteristics that belong to it alone and that are not defined by its manifestations in a particular body. The pernicious influence can only influence. It cannot determine. And with all the elements that are considered in Chinese medicine, it is just one piece, another sign to be woven into the pattern. All right, the last page. We're here for a whole hour, oh my goodness. Do we wanna just finish the chapter? It's five more pages. It'll probably take another half hour. Anyway, the seven emotions. Chinese medical practitioners have always recognized that emotional factors play a part in health and illness. The emotional life cannot be separated from the physical. Concern for the psychological texture of a patient's being must be part of a physician's examination, as the fundamental substances and the organs are all intimately connected to the emotions. The Nei Jiang cites seven emotions that particularly affect the body and that are still considered most important. Joy, anger, sadness, grief, pensiveness, fear, and fright. The differences between sadness and grief, fear and fright, appear to be of degree. Sometimes these pairs are combined as one emotion. Of course, emotional qualities are not in themselves pathological, and all of them appear in healthy individuals. It is only when an emotion is either excessive or insufficient over a long period of time, or when it arises very suddenly with great force, that it could generate imbalance and illness. And the reverse is also true. Internal disharmony can generate unbalanced emotional states. Emotional excess or insufficiency acts on the qi and on the other substances. The Neijing states that excess joy is associated with slow and scattered qi. Excess anger induces the qi to ascend. Excess sadness and grief weakens the qi. Excess pensiveness generates knottedness or stuckness. Fear results in descending qi, and fright induces chaotic qi. The seven emotions are also thought to correlate with the five yin organs. Joy with the heart. Y'all should know this if you take my glass. Anger with the liver, sadness and grief with the lungs, pensiveness with the spleen, and fear and fright with the kidneys. Disharmonies, another word for pensiveness could be worrying or anxiety. Disharmonies in one of these organs tend to produce an imbalance in the corresponding emotion and vice versa. The two organs considered most susceptible to emotional disturbances are the heart and the liver. One of the functions of the heart is to store the shen. Do we want to get music going again? Unharmonious emotions can lead easily to disturbances of the shen, resulting in insomnia, muddled thinking, inappropriate crying or laughing, and in extreme cases, fits, hysteria, and insanity. The liver harmonizes the emotions through its sprinkling function. The liver is a sprinkler. The liver has a sprinkling function. Thus, liver chi going in the wrong direction can be the result of excessive anger or the source of it. Disharmonies of the liver chi and anger accompany one another. Stagnation of the liver may be associated with any emotional frustration or with inappropriate and extreme mood changes. The seven emotions can also affect the other organs and substances. Excessive joy, for example, can scatter the heart chi, causing the shen to become muddled and uncontrolled. When excessive anger affects the liver, there may be signs such as dizziness, chest congestion, a bitter taste in the mouth, and pain in the upper abdomen and sides. 
Excessive sadness or grief may weaken the lung chi, while great fear can make kidney chi descend even to the point of causing a person to lose control of urination. So bedwetting could be fear. Excessive pensiveness may result in stagnation of the urination. Excessive pensiveness may result in stagnation of the chi, thereby disturbing the spleen's function of transforming food and leading to such abdominal symptoms as stomach dissension or poor digestion. The shen can become confused and flustered as a result of excessive fear or fright. The correspondences between the emotions, chi, and the organs are useful to the physician, but are not meant to be mechanically applied or rigidly adhered to. Although the seven emotions are said to be internal generative factors of disease, Chinese medicine does not see them as precisely defined causes, but accepts them as yet another source of information with which to weave patterns of disharmony. Clinical sketch. An individual is constantly angry and has nightmares. She complains of occasional dizziness, but otherwise feels healthy. I have really weird dreams last night. A Western physician <gasps> finds a slight elevation in blood pressure, but no other problem. He suggests that the patient see a psychiatrist to deal with her mental state. When the patient decides to try Chinese medicine, an examination reveals excessive liver activity. Acupuncture points such as liver 2, Xinjiang, or the walk between, and gallbladder 44, Chao Yin, opening of Yin, and herbs such as gardenia fruit and gentiana are used in the treatment. Gardenia fruit? I know gardenia is a flower, but I've never seen it have a fruit. Maybe it made a new bar. Has anyone seen a fruit on a garden? Hmm. Maybe before the flower? I don't, I don't know. All of these cool and disperse excess fire in the liver, markedly improving her condition. Way of life. This category of precipitating factors is traditionally called not external, not internal. In other words, it includes those factors that are neither pernicious influences, external, nor emotions, internal. To the West, these are usually considerations of lifestyle, and so they have been categorized as such. The Chinese, as much as any other culture, have put a lot of emphasis on the way people conduct their lives. Their ideal life would be lived in harmony with the universe. If this is achieved, the assumption is that the person will have attained inner harmony as well. The yin and yang will be balanced. The emotions will be even. Of course, all this is not the province of medicine alone, but is also the concern of the culture as a whole and all its members. The physician, however, is aware of this and is often called upon to treat disharmonies resulting from an unwise lifestyle and to point out inappropriate habits. Diet. Diet is considered an important influence on health and illness in Chinese medicine, and many books are devoted to dietary considerations. This concern for diet, however, never approaches the Hippocratic emphasis. Hippocrates, you know that guy? Because the stomach receives food and the spleen is responsible for transforming it into chi and blood, these two organs are most affected by diet. Irregularity in quantity or quality of food or in time of eating can disrupt bodily harmony. Insufficient food or lack of proper food can mean that insufficient raw material reaches the spleen. There will then be deficient chi and blood in the whole body or in certain organs. Excess food that obstructs the stomach's ripening and the spleen's transforming is called stagnant food. That's interesting, the ripening of the stomach and the transforming of the spleen. And may lead to such symptoms as distension, sour belching, or diarrhea. 
a predilection or dilection for certain types of food and also predilection generate disharmony. What does predilection mean? I don't think it's a predator election. A preference or special liking for something, a bias in favor of something. So what does it say? A predilection for certain types of food can also generate disharmony. If you love eating pretzels every day. The Chinese say that too much raw food can strain the yang aspects of the spleen and generate internal cold dampness, resulting in such signs as abdominal pain, diarrhea, or weakness. Fatty and greasy foods, alcohol or sweets, can produce dampness and heat. Improperly clean food may injure digestion. The Chinese people know many types of food, combinations of foods, and methods of preparation that are sometimes prescribed in medical literature and practice. This book is not primarily concerned with therapeutics, so Chinese dietary suggestions are not discussed. But even if they were, most Chinese dietary concepts would not be transferable to Western culture, except perhaps in Oriental restaurants. Diet, more than any other therapy, is strongly tied to a society's particular customs and habits. No Chinese book could tell Westerners what to eat for breakfast. Westerners would probably not be able to find the ingredients or prepare them, nor would many of them want to eat the result. And the Chinese could never give a reasoned opinion based on empirical experience on precisely when to eat or not to eat a lasagna. More important though, Chinese physicians, like doctors in all cultures, are used to being ignored when they make dietary recommendations. Hmm. Unfortunately, both patient and doctor too often feel that diet, while it's very useful in profession and recovery, is not potent or specific enough to correct many serious disharmonies. And it is thus generally given a reduced importance in medicine Diet feels like feelings are hurt. Sexual activity. In Chinese medical texts, excessive sexual activity is considered a precipitating factor of disease. Overindulgence is said to injure the kidney jing, which results in such symptoms as lumbago, dizziness, and general reduction of vitality. Giving birth too many times weakens the jing in blood, generating problems with menstruation and discharges. In the Chinese texts, sexual activity is referred to as affairs of the bedroom, and excess activity is never clearly defined. This is because propriety, pro, propriety in affairs of the bedroom is the province of the society in general, as well as of medicine. Social conventions and the standards of class position as opposed to bedroom positions, have always been as important as medical considerations in determining the appropriate level of activity. If a patient is considered to be engaging in excessive sexual activity, however, the doctor may suggest he or she have sex less often, but the doctor might as easily try to reharmonize the patient so that he or she would be physically able to sustain an increased amount of sexual activity. Using pattern thinking, one can always balance the configuration in several ways. Okay. Physical activity. The category of physical activity includes general life activity. All life activity to the Chinese should point toward the goal of living in harmonious balance with the cosmos, the seasons, and one's own constitution and stage of life. Young times, morning, spring, and youth, should be active periods in a person's life. Yin times, evening, winter, and old age, should be quiescent periods. The Neijing, what quiescent, let, let's look up that word. What exactly does quiescent mean? I mean, I know it means like peaceful, but I think it's something else. Inactivity, dormancy. Dormancy.
The Neijing, for instance, mentions that in the winter one should go to sleep early but arise late, and remain dormant like someone with private intentions, or as if one's intentions were already fulfilled. Physical activity is important to harmonize the flow of qi and blood and to develop strength in the body. Excessive labor, however, can strain the spleen's ability to produce qi and blood, leading to deficiencies of these substances. The body must rest, but excessive ease or slothfulness can weaken the vitality of qi and blood. Excessive use of a particular part of the body, a barber's hand, for instance, or a singer's voice, can lead to strain and disharmony. In some cases, the physician will suggest a change of lifestyle, but often this is impassable. In some cases, oh wait, in the case of a singer, for instance, the physician will prescribe treatments so that continual use of the voice would not throw the body out of balance. The physician would create a balance within the given situation. An inappropriate lifestyle can be both a generative factor of disharmony and a manifestation of disharmony itself. Inappropriate lifestyle accompanies disharmony. There is no beginning or end. A person who is always running around may drain the chi of various organs or conversely, may be manifesting hyperactivity of those organs. Someone who is always sitting around can cause the chi and blood to stagnate or may be manifesting depressed activity of the organs. Chinese medical practitioners are always concerned with the maintenance of health. The Neijing poetically says, to administer medicine after an illness begins is like digging a well after becoming thirsty or casting weapons after a battle has been engaged. What a great metaphorical group of things. To administer medicine after an illness begins is like digging a well after you're thirsty or casting weapons after you've already started fighting. Patients are often taught correct diet, proper attitudes, and healthful lifestyles. The central concern is always balance, rhythm, and harmony. Food, for instance, should be prepared and eaten in balance. Leafy green vegetables, a yin substance, should be cooked with ginger, which is yang. Tai Chi exercises encourage rhythmic and controlled movement. Adolescents are expected to have different emotional attitudes than the elderly. Brown people should do less demanding work than people with robust constitutions. One more page. Recommendations of this type are not made only by doctors. The determination of what is or is not a healthful lifestyle is made by the society at large and becomes part of a cultural model of how to live. Are we as a society modeling healthy lifestyle? Are we? The theory and practice of health are thus also the concern of philosophers, educators, cooks, homemakers, parents, grandparents, neighbors, and friends. I love it. And the last paragraph or two, miscellaneous factors. The Chinese... And then there's a bunch of notes. We don't need to read the notes for sure. Miscellaneous factors. The Chinese also recognize several other precipitating factors in illness, which strangely belong in the not external, not internal category. These include burns, bites, parasites, and trauma, sudden, easily identifiable conditions. Although these factors can be readily thought of as causes, the Chinese physician must nevertheless consider how they interact with other bodily signs and symptoms and must discern a pattern to re-harmonize. Even a snake bite or a burn can be isolated from the rest of a person's being. The miscellaneous factors are dealt with in the literature, literature but are not unique to Chinese medicine, nor are they essential to the understanding of the Chinese medical view. All of the precipitating factors discussed in this chapter would be called causes in the West. But 
It must be stressed again that in Chinese medicine, a distinct and separate, separable cause is unimportant. The relationship within a pattern are crucial. The relationships within a pattern are crucial. Any one factor is finally another piece of the whole. And the complete patient is treated, never for the cause, but for his or her unique configuration of signs and symptoms. The idea of causality in Chinese medicine is ultimately a means for identifying and qualifying the important relationships between environment, emotional character, personal lifestyle, and health and illness. I am so tired. Chapter five has been read from this book. Have a super night, day, evening. Hike around.